I now call to order the Society's 2,436th meeting in the 149th year since its founding on March 13th, 1871. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to PSW Science's Spring 2021 meeting and lecture series. Because of COVID-19, the Society is bringing this meeting to you via Zoom from locations all around the globe, rather than our usual home, the John Wesley Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club in Washington, DC. This evening's lecture will be about the Giant Magellan Telescope, now being built in the rarefied atmosphere of the Andes in Chile. When completed, it will have 10 times the resolving power of the Hubble Space Telescope. Our speaker is James Fanson, project director for the GMT. I'm Larry Milstein, president and program director of PSW Science, one of the oldest scientific societies of Washington, DC, founded in 1871 as the Philosophical Society of Washington to provide a forum to exchange scientific ideas, further scientific understanding, and encourage scientific inquiry, a mission it continues to this day. This lecture is being recorded and will be posted to the PSW Science YouTube channel, where it will join over 150 other recordings of PSW Science lectures. We invite you to explore these presentations and to become a member through the PSW Science website, www .pswscience.org. The Society is grateful for the sponsorships of the 2020-2021 lecture series by the Policy Studies Organization in cooperation with the American Public University and by a donor who was asked to remain anonymous. PSW thanks all of its sponsors. Before we turn to the lecture, in keeping with the Society's traditions, we will welcome new members and read the minutes of the previous meeting and the summary of the previous meeting's lecture. I'm very pleased to announce that the following members have been elected to the Society. Giovanni Aurelio, an independent consulting engineer interested in all things having to do with engineering who learned of PSW science from PSW member, Miles Taylor. Giuseppe Aurelio, an aeronautical engineer interested in mechanical and aeronautical engineering, who learned of PSW, again, from PSW member, Miles Taylor. Patricia Mott, a lawyer retired from the EPA, interested in astronomy, who learned of PSW science from an article in the Washington Post. And Jim Fanson, our speaker tonight, who learned of PSW through our invitation to him to give tonight's lecture. Some of his interests will be clear from tonight's presentation. We welcome them all to membership. Membership is a most important pillar of the society. I encourage everyone with an interest in science to become a member. It's easy to do using the PSW Science website, www.pswscience.org. PSW is a 501c3 charitable education and professional organization. Dues payments and other donations to PSW are tax deductible. Recording Secretary James Healan will now read the minutes of the 2,435th meeting and the lecture by Nikki Fox on the Parker Solar Probe. James. Thanks, Larry. On February 19th, 2021, by Zoom video conference broadcast on the PSW Science YouTube channel, President Larry Milstein called the 2,435th meeting of the Society to Order at 8.02 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. He announced the order of business. 
welcomed new members, and read the minutes of the previous meeting. President Milstein then introduced the speaker for the evening, Nicola Fox, Heliophysics Division Director and the Science Mission Directorate at NASA. Her lecture was titled, Hot, the Parker Solar Probe, Heliophysics Near the Edge of the Sun. In 2020, NASA's Heliophysics Division grew to a total of 20 operating missions with a total of 27 spacecraft, 11 missions in formulation, and nine further missions under study. In addition to providing Earth with an early warning system for solar weather, the Heliophysics Division spacecraft are seeking answers to long-standing mysteries of solar physics. Why is the corona hotter than the solar surface? Where does the solar wind originate and how is it accelerated? How are solar energetic solar energetic particles accelerated and transported. In 1958, Eugene Parker published a paper predicting the solar wind to break away from the pull of the sun and bathe the planets in a protective field. Parker has told Fox he reached his findings merely by solving six fairly simple equations. Among Parker's predictions was solar wind acceleration. 60 years after Eugene Parker's paper, on August 12th, 2018, NASA launched the Parker Solar Probe atop a Delta IV with an upper stage. The probe is humanity's first visit to a star. Parker's sister mission, the ESA Solar Orbiter, launched in early 2020 and will conduct coordinated measurements. At launch, the probe had a wet mass of 685 kilograms and stood three meters tall. Fox said the payload needed to remain as light as possible to avoid being dragged at launch by Earth's angular momentum. She then described NASA's decision to include momentum wheels on the spacecraft. The Parker Solar Probe is in a region of plasma approximately 3 million degrees Celsius. Fox said that because the plasma itself is not very dense, NASA's greater concern for the spacecraft is heat from illumination. That illumination is reflected by a white cover in front of a 4.5 inch thick carbon composite heat shield attached to the main vehicle by only six carbon bolts. The front side of the heat shield reaches approximately 1400 degrees Celsius, while the main body of the spacecraft stays between 28 and 30 degrees Celsius. The spacecraft is powered by liquid cooled solar panels designed to operate under extreme solar flux. The articulated panels flap according to the probe's proximity to the sun to generate consistent power. Fox then described the probe's launch using video and vivid animations. After launch, the spacecraft made its first orbit of Venus to slow itself down. It will make 24 orbit orbits of Venus over the lifetime of its mission. Each orbit will send the probe closer to the sun. After the seventh, the probe will be traveling at approximately 430 miles per hour and pass 3.9 million miles from the sun's surface through the solar corona. The Parker Solar Probe carries four instrument suites. These instruments are used to conduct the field experiment designed to study magnetic fields, the solar wind electrons, alphas, and protons, or SWEEP investigation, the integrated science investigation of the sun, or ISIS, to observe energetic particles, and the wide field imager for solar probe, or WHISPER, to image the solar corona and inner heliosphere. Fox then described Parker's current science results. She showed an animated compilation of the probe's imaging of the solar corona at resolutions impossible from observation at further distances. The whisper instrument has made multiple discoveries. The imager has confirmed the existence of magnetic islands where particles can be trapped, energized, and heated. It is also on the verge of confirming the existence of a dust-free zone around the sun. The probe's observations have identified unexpected magnetic structures in the young solar wind. These switchbacks are a potential energy source for coronal heating. And the probe has discovered extended co-rotation of the solar wind. Fox concluded by discussing the going journeys of the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 spacecraft through the outer solar system environment. Voyager 1 was the first to cross the heliopause boundary, but did not have a functioning solar wind instrument at the time. In 2018, scientists were able to confirm Voyager 2 exited the heliosphere because its energetic particle detectors identified dramatic changes in the ratio of heliospheric particles to galactic cosmic rays. The speaker then answered questions from the online viewing audience. 
One member asked about how the Parker Solar Probe communicated with Earth. Fox said the probe stores approximately 250 gigabits of data per orbit onto a solid state data recorder. NASA uses X-band to send commands to the probe and downlinks data on a KA band when the probe nears Earth. Another member asked about the latitude at which the probe observes the sun. Fox said the probe stays in the elliptic and does not observe any other latitudes. After the question and answer period, President Milstein thanked the speaker, made the usual housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the society. At 10.03 p.m., President Milstein adjourned the meeting. The temperature in Washington, D.C., three degrees Celsius. Weather, partly cloudy. Number of concurrent viewers on the Zoom and YouTube live stream, 110, and views on the PSW Science YouTube and Vimeo channels, 328. Respectfully submitted, James Heelan, Recording Secretary. Thank you, James. The minutes will be posted in due course to the website. Please send any corrections or comments on the minutes to Corresponding Secretary Robin Taylor at corresponding sec at pswscience.org. A video of the lecture is available to any, everyone without charge on the PSW Science YouTube channel, the PSW Science Vimeo channel, and it can be accessed directly from the PSW Science website, www.pswscience.org. We now turn to tonight's lecture. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, James Fanson. Jim is project manager for the Giant Magellan Telescope. Prior to taking on the role of project manager with GMTO, he was with JPL for 30 years, serving as project manager for the Galaxy Evolution Explorer, the Keck Interferometer, and the Kepler mission, leading the pre preliminary design team for the Spitzer Space Telescope, and serving on the team that rescued the optical performance of the Hubble Space Telescope. Among other honors and awards, Jim received two NASA Outstanding Leadership Medals, a NASA Engineering Achievement Medal, NASA's Allen Award for Excellence, the National Space Club Goddard Trophy, the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum Trophy, and he was Program Manager on the Kepler team that received the Aviation Week Laureate Award. Jim earned his PhD in Applied Mechanics at Caltech. All questions will be fielded in the Q&A session after the lecture. Jim, the screen is yours. Thank you, Larry, and uh, thank you all for attending my talk. I'm going to share my screen. All right, um, I'm gonna to talk to you about the building of the Giant Magellan Telescope. I'm gonna start by reviewing a bit of the history of the telescope, uh, explaining why it is we uh, continually wanna build a, a bigger telescope. Uh, talk to you a bit about some of the engineering challenges we face and some of the science that we anticipate doing. Now, I'm gonna start with the human eye, which is actually a, a remarkable uh, uh, optical system <clears throat> and it functions a bit like a, like a, a simple telescope. The human eye uh, has a, a pupil that allows light in and a lens which focuses the light. Uh, and it'll, it has a, what we would call an aperture that of about 0.2 square centimeters. Uh, that, that's the area of the pupil when it's dilated by a bit. And with the human eye on a dark adapted night, uh, you can see about 6,000 stars in the sky. Uh, and, and that's about it. Uh, anything that is very far away um, is generally too faint. The faintest uh, distant object, or I should say the most distant object you can see with the naked eye is the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, but beyond that, you need uh, assistance. Uh, the human eye needs assistance. So principally the telescope uh, has been invented uh, to allow us to see things that are far away, uh, look at them more up close, and to allow us to see things that are too faint uh, to be seen uh, with the unaided eye. 
The first person that we know of to turn a telescope to the heavens was Galileo back in 1609. And he took meticulous notes. And we know that with his telescope, which had only a one inch aperture with a lens in the front of a tube, uh, he was able to discover that the moon had craters and mountains, that the sun had sunspots, uh, that the sun seemed to rotate, and that the planet Venus went through various phases, uh, which supported the theory that the uh, planets, including the Earth, orbited the sun rather than the other way around. Uh, and uh, it was really revolutionary. It, it transformed our understanding of, uh, of the solar system. Uh, Galileo also discovered that there were four moons that orbited the planet Jupiter. And those moons are now named after him as the Galilean satellites. Then uh, telescope technology progressed and uh, the largest telescope of the same type that uh, Galileo had built, a uh, ref so-called refracting telescope with a lens in the front, was the Yerkes uh, 40 inch telescope with a one meter lens uh, which was uh, commissioned and uh, made its first observations in 1897. Uh, it was uh, financed by Charles Yerkes from Chicago. You can see his uh, face in the edifice of the beautiful building there at Lake Geneva. But uh, with one meter lenses, uh, refracting telescopes uh, reach their limit. And this is a recurring theme in telescopes is that you want to build the largest telescope uh, that your technology will support and that your pocketbook can afford. Uh, and typically the most important element in a telescope is the light gathering uh, lens, or as we'll see now, mirrors. Uh, lenses above one meter in size are very difficult to manufacture. Uh, and so telescope makers turn to reflective telescopes using mirrors instead of lenses after this point. One of the most famous telescopes is the Hooker telescope, the 100 inch telescope on Mount Wilson that was bought, uh, built by George Ellery Hale. Uh, and this is the telescope that Edwin Hubble used to discover uh, that there are galaxies outside of the Milky Way and to discover the expansion of the universe. Again, uh, transforming our understanding of the size, scale and our place uh, in the universe. On the right-hand side is uh, perhaps the most famous photograph ever taken in astronomy. This is the so-called VAR plate, which resides in a plate vault at the Carnegie Observatories in Pasadena. Uh, this is an image of the Andromeda galaxy and Hubble was looking for variable stars and uh, discovered a variable star of a particular type that allowed him then to infer the distance to the Andromeda galaxy uh, and, and that's how our understanding of the scale of the universe was transformed. Then George Ellery Hale went on to build a 200 inch telescope, so-called Hale telescope named after him at Palomar Mountain. Um, the mirror uh, for this telescope was cast in 1934 and it was a heroic struggle uh, to figure out how to uh, manufacture a mirror that was five meters in diameter you can see it on the right, you're looking at the back surface, the light waiting uh, pockets are visible, the reflective surfaces on the other side. Um, and if you're interested in the story of this telescope, there's a marvelous book written by uh, Ronald Florence called The Perfect Machine, which will take you through all the trials, tribulations, inventions, and, uh, and geniuses involved in the building of this telescope. Um, it was interrupted by the Second World War, but uh, saw first light in 1949. And building a larger mirror than five meters was so formidable uh, that no larger working telescope uh, was, uh, was built until the Keck telescope in the uh, 1990s. So for, uh, for 40 years or more, uh, the Palomar five meter was the world's largest uh, scientific telescope. <clears throat> but then by the 1990s, uh, technology had progressed in terms of computer control equipment and uh, photoelectric sensors uh, that made it possible to conceive of a telescope that could be uh, built with a segmented primary mirror. 
so Jerry Nelson at the uh, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory uh, had the, a bold uh, concept that one could mosaic a series of hexagonal mirror segments, and you can see a mirror segment on the right-hand side, about 1.8 meter from flat to flat, uh, take 36 of these segments and then using uh, edge sensors and computer control, align these segments as though they formed a single mirror surface. And, they, that, uh, and to do that is called phasing of the mirror segments. And they have to be phased uh, with a, within a small fraction of the wavelength of light that you're observing. Uh, so that was a formidable undertaking and many people felt, felt that this was an impossible task, but indeed uh, the Keck telescope was a tremendous success. It broke the five meter aperture barrier uh, and achieved a 10 meter aperture. We're now talking about a light gathering power of a telescope that's uh, 4 million times the, uh, the light uh, that can enter the human eye. Around the same time, people were working on technologies to build larger monolithic mirrors. Uh, and one of those techniques, the spin cast mirror technology was developed by Roger Angel at the University of Arizona. And you can see on the left uh, image, an 8.4 meter spin cast mirror, uh, side by side now to scale with the Hale five meter telescope mirror. And you, and you can see uh, the light waiting pockets again on the, on the back surface. Uh, so this technology uh, enabled uh, a series of telescopes with very large monolithic mirrors. And the advantage of having monolithic mirrors is that every time you introduce an edge to uh, incoming light from a, a heavenly object, uh, there's a scattering of light that occurs, a diffraction effect uh, that occurs with light, uh, which reduces the contrast of the image and creates other uh, difficulties. And so the quality of imaging of a telescope is enhanced if you can minimize the edges. Uh, and that's one advantage of having a large monolithic mirror. So it's interesting to plot as a function of time, uh, the largest telescope in the world. Uh, and if you plot it on a log scale, you can fit uh, with a pretty good uh, correlation, a straight line uh, in that in that plot. And you discover that over time, since the time of Galileo, uh, that the world's largest telescope basically doubles in size about every 30 years. And this is because of the advance of technology. Uh, you also discover that it becomes less expensive <clears throat> per unit of telescope aperture, um, uh, again, because of advanced manufacturing techniques and technology. <clears throat> so the current generation of eight and 10 meter telescopes today was developed in the 90s and the zeros. Uh, and so it, it's time actually. Um, the current generation of telescopes was built about 30 years ago. So it's time now for the next doubling. And indeed there are now three so-called extremely large telescopes that are in development across the world. The Giant Magellan Telescope, the 30 meter telescope, and the European Extremely Large Telescope or European ELT. Uh, and these are scheduled to come online uh, in the next uh, 10 or 15 years. And so the Giant Magellan Telescope is going to take its place as a 25 meter telescope. And what we're doing is taking advantage of these two breakthroughs that occurred in the 20th century, uh, the segmented primary mirror and computer control. Uh, as well as the uh, very large monolithic mirror technology. So what we are going to do is form a primary mirror out of seven individual mirror segments, each of which is 8.4 meters in diameter. And that will give us a telescope with 19 million times the light gathering power of the human eye, uh, a truly staggering uh, capability. Now, um, it's interesting to look at the benefit of a large telescope from the point of view of the physics of light. So uh, one of the important aspects when you're looking at objects that are deep in the universe, far away and therefore very faint, uh, is you wanna gather as much light as possible because when you're studying celestial objects, 
uh, it's not just the imaging you want to do. You want to take spectra of these objects. And the spectra allows you to determine the composition of what you're looking at, uh, the physical processes that are going on in that object. You can say something about the chemistry that's taking place. And to take a spectra means you have to disperse the light, spread the light out, if you will, spectrally, uh, to take its, uh, its, its fingerprint, so to speak. Uh, and you need a lot of light in order to be able to have a reasonable signal to noise ratio. So uh, if you wanna see fainter objects, and you wanna gather more light and you need a large telescope. Of course, the amount of light that a telescope gathers goes with the square of the aperture. But due to the physical nature of light, uh, the resolution or the amount of detail that you can observe in an object uh, increases linearly with the aperture of the telescope. So a telescope that has twice the diameter will be able to image with twice the imaging resolution, uh, provided you can correct for the distortion effect of the Earth's atmosphere. And I'm gonna spend some bit of time talking about that. So the way we correct for atmospheric distortion is with a technology we call adaptive optics, also a 20th century technology. Uh, so when you see the term AO, you're going to know what, that, uh, what that's referring to. So I'm gonna show you some comparisons here uh, of a, a collection of stars in the near infrared part of the spectrum. And this is the resolution that a telescope would have if you were observing through the Earth's atmosphere from a, a reasonably good observing site on the Earth. And it would not matter how large your telescope is because the inherent resolution is limited by the native atmosphere. And I'll explain a little bit uh, more later why that is. Uh, but if you're able uh, then to uh, correct for the Earth's atmosphere and achieve the diffraction limit, or if you could go into orbit above the Earth's atmosphere into space, uh, this is a comparison of the kind of imaging resolution you can achieve. So this is a Hubble Space Telescope which has a 2.4 meter aperture, uh, again, in the, in the near infrared. This is the resolution of that same scene uh, that we would expect to see from the James Webb Space Telescope, which NASA schedules, uh, is scheduled to launch later this year, which is a six and a half meter aperture. And then with a 25 meter aperture, the, the aperture of the Giant Magellan Telescope, this is the kind of resolution you could achieve. So if you wanna look in detail at objects, or you wanna look very close to an object, for example, looking for a, an exoplanet orbiting another star, you have to look very close to the star to find the planet. Or if you wanna uh, understand what's going on close to the event horizon of a, a black hole, you need to look close to the black hole uh, if you want that kind of imaging resolution, you need a larger telescope. So this, these two features of gathering more light and having inherently higher resolution um, are, the re are what drive us basically to want to build ever larger telescopes. Now this image uh, taken by the Hubble Space Telescope is called the ultra deep field. Uh, this is an image that uh, was taken of about the most empty part of the sky that NASA could identify. And you have to remember that the field of view of the Hubble telescope is quite small. It's, it's about the grain of, a grain of sand held at arm's length. That's how much of the sky it observes at any given time. And this is a small fraction of that field. Uh, and what you're seeing here, essentially every object in this image is a galaxy uh, deep in the universe. Uh, so these are not stars in our galaxy. These are, these are separate galaxies and they're quite distant. And the more distant a galaxy is, the more uh, or further back in time you're observing because of the finite speed of light, uh, it takes light time to travel through space from one point to another. Uh, and as we look deeper in the universe, we're looking uh, back in time. We're seeing the universe as it was uh, in the distant past. Uh, we know from uh, 
astronomical observations that the universe uh, began in a big bang that occurred about 13.8 billion years ago. Uh, and when you look at this image, there are certain objects that are so far away, they're so far back in time that the light has been stretched uh, and shifted into the red. And these objects are, are very distant indeed. When you blow up uh, what the Hubble images of these objects look like, you're looking at, at some of the earliest galaxies after the Big Bang. These are galaxies that are less than 300 million years old after the Big Bang. And we're very interested in understanding how the first stars and galaxies formed. Uh, and when you look at galaxies from the early epoch of cosmic history, you see they look quite different than galaxies do today, like our Milky Way galaxy. So we very much want to be able to study these objects in greater uh, detail and to take spectra of these objects to understand the physical processes that are uh, taking place. If we look a bit later in the age of the galaxy, this is a, a redshift of two. This corresponds to what astronomers call cosm uh, 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 cosmic noon. This is a, a period of time in the evolution of the universe where star formation seems to have uh, reached a maximum. Um, and understanding how galaxies assembled themselves out of stars that are forming uh, is key to understanding galaxy evolution uh, and how galaxies came to be the way they are and how stars and systems formed. Uh, so if you were to take a current eight meter telescope, this is the uh, uh, what you would see from the Gemini telescope on the right against a synthetic image of what the galaxy uh, really looks like on the left. Uh, even with adaptive optics to correct for the atmosphere, uh, this object is so far away uh, and so faint that the, the resolution you can achieve is quite limited. However, moving to a 25 meter telescope like the Giant Magellan Telescope, this is what we would expect to be able to image. So we would now be able to take spectra of individual regions of the galaxy and begin to understand uh, better how galaxies uh, formed and evolved over cosmic time. So a consortium of institutions have joined forces to build the Giant Magellan Telescope. They're listed here. I'm not going to name them all. Uh, and uh, we've chosen to locate our telescope at the Las Campanas Observatory site uh, in uh, the southern end of the Atacama Desert in the Chilean Andes. This is land that is owned by the Carnegie Institution for Science, uh, which is one of our founder institutions, and where they have their uh, twin six and a half meter Magellan telescopes located. Uh, so we're gonna uh, locate at that, at that same site and we will be the giant Magellan telescope. Where to locate a telescope is a really important uh, issue uh, there are essentially four features you're looking for for uh, locating a site for a giant telescope. One is you want a site obviously that's dark, particularly if you're an optical infrared telescope, you want something free of light pollution. You want something that is uh, a site that is cloud free, so you have uh, uh, no obstructions to observing the heavens. And you want dry air uh, because in particular the moisture in air absorbs light and there are regions of the spectrum that you cannot observe through the Earth's atmosphere. And the more moisture you have, uh, the more absorption that occurs. Uh, this is what tends to drive telescopes to mountaintops. So you have less atmosphere above you when you're at high altitude. And then importantly, you want steady air. Uh, and the reason for that uh, is that the Earth's atmosphere is really composed of cells of air that are uh, each cell is at a different temperature and the refractive index of air changes with its temperature. And as the light from a, a celestial object arrives at the earth, it's traveled all the way across the, the universe to reach us. Uh, and you can think of the, the wave as a, a, the wave nature of light. You can think of these expanding spherical waves of light coming across the, the universe. By the time they reach us, they're basically flat. And so you get these beautiful plane waves of light striking the atmosphere, and then they go through this turbulent, unsteady air 
and the wavefront gets all distorted. And this is what causes stars to twinkle when you look at them uh, with, an, with your naked eye. And this is what means uh, that any telescope uh, is going to have a limited resolution, limited by the atmosphere, by this effect. Uh, but you can minimize this effect by selecting a site on the ground that has very smooth uh, and steady air. By the way, I'm going to come back to this adaptive optics topic, uh, which is a technology we use to combat this effect. And AO uh, works best at sites that already start out with uh, as stable and smooth an air as possible. So this tends to drive you to locations on the Earth that are either mid-ocean volcanic island peaks uh, or continental coastal mountains where you have smooth air flowing from the ocean over the continent. Uh, and this is why you tend to find the world's largest telescopes on uh, mountain peaks in Hawaii, on uh, Mauna Kea or Haleakala, or in the Canary Islands, uh, or in the Southern Hemisphere in the Chilean Andes, which is where we are locating. Now, of course, uh, as I said before, um, the ultimate uh, best place to observe the heavens is from space where you get above the atmosphere, uh, but getting to space is a difficult task and comes with its own challenges. So this is an artist rendering of what the completed Giant Magellan Telescope Observatory will look like. Uh, it's a very dry location. Uh, there's more than 300 nights of clear air uh, with exceptionally uh, steady airflow. Uh, I'll point out a couple of features here. Uh, this is the building that houses and protects the telescope that we call the enclosure. Uh, this building to the left of the enclosure is where we process and coat the primary mirror segments. And I'll say more about that. And then all the noisy machinery, the rotating pumps and so on that supply uh, fluids and coolants uh, and air conditioning and so on are located uh, away from the telescope. Uh, and then we have our water storage and distribution system. So this is, uh, this is what the completed observatory will look like. I'll show you later on a, a drone image of what the site looks like at, at the moment. Now, it's a little hard to tell the scale uh, from this image out in the Atacama Desert. Uh, so if we relocate the observatory into the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, this is, uh, this is what it would look like. So it's enclosures about 60 meters in diameter, about 65 meters high, uh, and uh, is uh, yeah, quite an undertaking in and of itself. Um, has many specialized functions that has, have to work in concert with the telescope. All right. Now, there are a number of novel features of the Giant Magellan Telescope. Most modern telescopes, whether they're on the ground or in space, are of a uh, reflecting uh, telescope design with a primary mirror and a secondary mirror. Uh, in our case, uh, this primary mirror and the secondary mirror are segmented. So there are seven segments in, in each of the primary and secondary mirror. Um, and they operate in pairs. So as light comes into the telescope from a, from a heavenly object, uh, it uh, will first strike a primary mirror and then be reflected and strike a corresponding secondary mirror and then proceed down through a hole in the center segment uh, to reach the scientific instruments that make the scientific measurements. Um, our telescope follows uh, what's called a Gregorian optical design. This is a design that was um, invented by the Scottish mathematician, James uh, Gregory, who was a contemporary of Isaac Newton. Uh, however, most telescopes today you'll find are made to the Ritchie Cratian uh, configuration, the Hubble telescope, the Keck telescope, those are Ritchie Cratian designs. Uh, and one of the interesting aspects of the Gregorian and one of the, one of the reasons we like it uh, is that uh, in the Gregorian design, uh, both the primary mirror and the secondary mirror are concave. In the Ritchie Cradian design, the secondary mirror is convex, which is more difficult to manufacture. Another advantage is that the light comes to, the, to a focus before it reaches the secondary mirror and reflects down to the scientific instruments. 
And this allows us to do things like place uh, point sources of light to calibrate our adaptive optic system and do other calibrations more conveniently. And finally, the uh, Gregorian design gives us a very compact plate scale, uh, which means that our scientific instruments are much uh, more modest in size and complexity, uh, easier and cheaper to manufacture, and it gives us a very large field of view uh, that we can achieve. So some of the challenges that we face uh, is that because our primary and secondary mirror are both segmented, we need to find a way to do an alignment of this system and to phase the telescope. Uh, and no one has ever built a doubly segmented telescope and, and phased it before. So we know and understand uh, that this is a challenge. Now looking at the arrangement of primary mirror segments, just to give you again a sense of scale, uh, the um, primary mirror segments are 8.4 meters in diameter in our case. The hole in the center segment is 2.4 meters, which just turns out to be the size of the mirror in the Hubble Space Telescope. So you can see the challenge um, of putting telescopes in space. You have to put them on a rocket and get them into orbit. Uh, and that's a difficult thing to do and it tends to limit uh, the size of the telescope you can get into space. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, which NASA will launch later this year, uh, is uh, by far the largest telescope ever to go into space at six and a half meters. Uh, but by ground-based standards, uh, by the standards of the extremely large telescopes, uh, James Webb will, will still be a small telescope. So the amount of light it can gather will be, will be small by comparison. And there's a human figure there uh, for scale at the bottom. All right, I'm gonna take you on a tour now of the Giant Magellan Telescope. I'm gonna run a video and I'm gonna narrate as we go through here. We zoom in uh, to the enclosure with the biparting doors opening. You can see the telescope beginning to tilt downward on its elevation axis and the mirror covers open. Uh, the mirror covers protect the reflective surface of the primary mirror segments. As we descend, you see these red colored portions of the telescope, those are the mirror cells. And I'll show you a photograph uh, of a uh, prototype cell. And you can see the curved C rings of the elevation axis. And below them is the azimuth axis. So, so this is a, a, an elevation azimuth uh, mount with hydrostatic bearings. So these, these bearings float on a thin film of oil. Now zooming into the center of the telescope, let me let this run a little further. This is where the scientific instruments are located. And the instruments are all attached or mounted to what we call the Gregorian instrument rotator, which is a six meter by nine meter cylinder. Uh, and all the scientific instruments, our acquisition guiding and wavefront sensing system uh, are attached to the cylinder and the cylinder rotates along it, about its long axis uh, in order to de-rotate the image rotation that occurs as the telescope tracks an object across the sky. So this is also a unique feature of GMT and this precision motion adds a third uh, axis of rotation to the telescope. Now mounted on the top of the GIR, uh, of the six by nine meter cylinder are instruments that receive their light. The light comes down from the telescope above, strikes a tertiary mirror and is then is directed into one of these scientific instruments. If we continue the video and descend into the interior of the GIR, we have another set of scientific instruments we call direct Gregorian instruments. We call them direct because the light comes directly from the secondary mirror of the telescope into the scientific instrument. So there are only two reflections. And this is important because every reflection uh, causes a loss of light. So if you lose you know, a percent per reflection soon, you know, you're starting to, to lose significant light. So the fewer the reflections, the better in our design can deliver light to instruments with only two reflections. So 
So I'm going to walk you through now how these giant mirrors are manufactured. Um, they are uh, cast in a spinning mold uh, inside a spinning furnace. Uh, this is a photograph taken uh, at the Richard F. Karras Mirror Laboratory at the University of Arizona. All of this uh, mirror production occurs underneath the football stadium at the University of Arizona. And what you're looking at is, is the uh, furnace with the lid removed uh, and the technicians are building up the mold. And there are 1,700 individually machined uh, silica alumina blocks uh, and they each have a different configuration, a different shape, uh, and they're separated by a half an inch gap. Uh, and once the glass flows into this mold, this forms the honeycomb structure, which lightweights the mirror. These mirrors are 80% light weighted, so they're very stiff, uh, but they're comparatively lightweight. Once the mold is in place, then uh, borosilicate glass that's manufactured in small batches in Japan uh, are placed uh, by hand in the mold. There's about 20 tons of glass that's uh, placed in the mold for, for each of these castings. You can see the technicians there carefully placing the glass. And then the furnace is heated up and spun. Uh, and when the temperature uh, reaches the melting point of the glass, the glass flows and is propelled by the centrifugal force of the spinning uh, into the mold and it forms a parabolic surface on the top front surface of the mirror, which makes it uh, much closer to the final net shape of the mirror and saves a lot of time from having to grind that glass away. It comes close to the near uh, net shape. Now I'm gonna next run you a time-lapse video of this process. Uh, and it, it runs a little too fast to narrate, but at least you'll have some context for, for what you're looking at. So this is the construction of the mold on the floor of the rotating furnace. Uh, this is the refractory material, uh, which is held together by Inconel uh, bands to take the, uh, the stress. Then the cores are installed. These are the machined cores that form the honeycomb pattern. And next you'll see the glass uh, uh, laid in the mold. Uh, and then the lid is put on for the final time. It's heated up and, and spun. And this is a camera inside the mold. You can see the glass uh, melt, flow together and achieve the right expected level. This is how we know we've had a successful casting. And then the oven is opened. The, form is removed and we glue on a lifting fixture and lift the mirror out of the furnace, out of the mold. So we have now cast uh, five of the seven segments that are needed for the Giant Magellan Telescope. The sixth mirror is being cast as we speak uh, and the high temperature will occur early tomorrow afternoon. Uh, and if all goes well, we'll have the sixth segment cast uh, and uh, and have only one to go to form the, the primary mirror. This is what it looks like when it's uh, out of the mold. There's a careful inspection uh, performed. You can see someone gingerly walking on the front surface. It's then lifted and all of the refractory material is cleared out, leaving all of these hollow light weighting areas. This is the rear surface of segment five. And then we bond onto the back surface attachment points uh, in order to support the, mi the mirror. The mirror, uh, this is the rear surface with what we call load spreaders bonded on. There are about 165 pneumatic actuators, force actuators that support the mirror when it's in operation. Uh, in some sense, the mirror rests on a bed of nails, but each of these nails is a force actuator that we can control very precisely the amount of force applied to the mirror. And this allows us to keep the mirror in the correct shape. Uh, so the mirror has to be uh, you know, to the desired shape to very high precision in order to achieve diffraction limited imaging. We then rotate the mirror over and begin polishing uh, the front surface. This shows a uh, mirror segment one under the polisher and you can see uh, there's an active lap uh, located here. This is a com computer controlled lap that varies the forces uh, on the lap. 
Now, because these mirror segments, uh, the six outer ring segments of the Giant Magellan Telescope are off axis. So they have a bit of a potato, ship, uh, potato chip shape to them, which is a complex shape to polish into a mirror. So no mirror this size had ever been polished into an off axis shape. And so considerable time was spent proving uh, that we could do that. Uh, and this is the segment that that was proved on. And the polishing has to be precise to about one millionth of an inch. Uh, again, that's a, a fraction of the wavelength of light that you're observing. In. Once the polishing is complete, we put a protective layer, uh, a strippable layer uh, over the uh, reflective surface and lift it with a uh, collection of suction cups and a crane and place it into a shock mounted steel transport container to protect it uh, for its 5,000 mile journey uh, to Chile. Uh, we have two completed mirrors now. They're in storage uh, in Tucson, awaiting their shipment to Chile. You can see one here uh, being uh, offloaded from the transport. And uh, this is a photograph of one of the mirror cells that I mentioned earlier during the video. They were the red shaped objects in the video. Uh, and this shows uh, on the top surface of the cell are a series of basic, sh basically shock mount springs. Uh, this is what the, the mirror rests on when it's not in operation on the telescope. And these also protect the mirror uh, if there's a large earthquake uh, to prevent the mirror from, uh, from, from damage. Now protruding up <clears throat> through the top plate of the cell are some of these hundreds of pneumatic actuators. They're arranged in a triple actuator arrangement so we can put forces, uh, basically uh, uh, lateral and axial forces uh, to support the mirror at whatever angle the mirror is at in the telescope. And we're building this as a test bed to verify that we can control the mirror to the precision that we need to control it with this arrangement of, of actuators. Once we're finished with the mirrors and we've shipped them to Chile, uh, they will probably leave uh, the port of Houston and uh, travel through the Panama Canal to a port city in Chile and then overland on the Pan American Highway up the access road of the mountain uh, to the summit of the observatory. And then uh, we will uh, lift the mirrors out of their transport containers and place them on the mirror cells and the mirrors and the mirror cells then go into a very large coating chamber where we apply a reflective coating of aluminum to the front surface uh, that's about uh, 200 nanometers thick. We use about a half an ounce of aluminum per mirror, uh, which forms the reflective surface. Then the mirrors are taken into the enclosure. Uh, they come up by crane, overhead crane, through a hatch in the observing floor integrated onto the telescope structure. You can see them here again with the mirror covers protecting the reflective surface. Now I've mentioned the importance of phasing the telescope and the fact that we have these large mirror segments with sizable gaps between them. Uh, we had to come up with a method for phasing uh, these segments. So basically what we do is using light from a guide star that's coming through the telescope. Uh, we take portions of light that are reflected off of adjacent edges of adjacent segments. Uh, these are one and a half meter uh, square areas. And this basically forms a series of two slit experiments, if you will, uh, that form interference fringes. And we then disperse those fringes in wavelength uh, and we can tell the differential piston or the misalignment of the edges uh, by the degree to which the interference fringes have rotated. So on the left, it shows you the interference pattern with zero phase difference between adjacent mirror segments. And on the right, with 10 microns of phase difference. So for our telescope, we're gonna continually monitor the alignment of the segments and continually adjust them to keep them in phase 
Uh, and we need to observe three guide stars uh, for that purpose. And we do that measurement uh, in the near infrared where the atmospheric coherence length uh, is long enough to uh, assure a good measurement over the gaps between these segments. These dispersed fringe sensors that are used to phase the telescope are located in what we call our acquisition guiding and wavefront sensing system. There are four such units that are bolted to the top of the GIR, the six by nine meter cylinder. And they look like this with a, uh, a pickoff mirror that can be extended and rotated uh, into the field of view. So it patrols around in the field of view to find guide stars. We've taken a prototype of this phasing system onto the clay telescope at the Magellan, uh, the Magellan clay telescope at the Las Campanas Observatory and we have a prototype of the dispersed, dispersed uh, fringe sensor prisms. This is what it would be like for the full giant Magellan telescope. And we have a smaller scale prototype in here where we synthesize a segmented mirror at the clay telescope and see how well this uh, uh, approach works in the, uh, in the presence of various disturbances. Now I'm gonna come back to this important topic of adaptive optics or how we defeat the distortion in the Earth's atmosphere. This was first uh, proposed by Horace Babcock, but in an era before there was the computer and sensor technology to make this work. And the basic idea is that as starlight is distorted through the Earth's atmosphere, if you can reflect that light off of a, a mirror that you can bend into a, uh, a shape that will compensate for the distortion of the, of the, uh, of the atmosphere, by means of actuators that you can control, then the reflected light will be restored. You'll have the wavelength uh, flattened back out. Uh, and this system was developed by the military. It was classified for a long period of time, but then it was declassified and is now commonplace in astronomical observatories. The challenge of course, is that you need a deformable mirror and you need to update the shape about 1000 times a second because the atmosphere is turbulent and the distortion is ever changing. So we accomplished that on the Giant Magellan Telescope up at our segmented secondary mirror. This is a close up of what that assembly looks like. And each of these secondary mirrors is an adaptive secondary mirror. It's actually going to be a fourth generation adaptive secondary mirror from the company Ad Optica in Italy. And each of these mirrors will contain 672 actuators or nearly 5,000 actuators across all seven mirrors. We're gonna operate them at a two kilohertz bandwidth uh, to do the uh, adaptive optics for GMT. And locating them up at the secondary mirror gives us the ability to do correction of the ground layer uh, uh, disturbance, which is where most or a good fraction, uh, perhaps not most, but a good fraction of the uh, distortion occurs in the atmosphere. And that ground layer correction uh, allows us to correct over a wide field of view so we can improve the imaging uh, even for, for wide field observations. For areas of the sky where we do not have a, uh, a sufficient number of natural guide stars, a technology has been developed called laser guide stars where you fire lasers up through the telescope and the lasers, if they have the right wavelength, uh, can excite the sodium atoms that are left behind the trace amount of sodium in the very upper atmosphere by the burning up of meteorites uh, as they come through the atmosphere. And uh, you, can, you can excite emission, stimulate emission uh, from those atoms and form uh, synthetic guide stars, which you can then use for the adaptive optics uh, uh, function. Turning now to scientific instruments, I'm gonna pick the pace up a bit. Um, our instruments are located again in the Gregorian instrument rotator. We have various instrument stations. Uh, we can, so we can locate and move from one instrument to another during the night if necessary. This is the first generation of instruments is basically four very capable spectrographs. We have two spectrographs in the optical and two in the near infrared out to five microns. 
uh, and two of them are very high resolution and two of them are intended to be very high sensitivity uh, and multi-object. Uh, the first light instrument, the first instrument on the sky will be this uh, instrument we call G-clef. And this is a, an a shell spectrograph, very high spectral resolution. Uh, this will be important for exploring the atmospheres of exoplanets uh, to try to look for signs of life uh, on those planets and for having a very high precision radio velocity capability of 10 centimeters per second uh, to look for the existence of exoplanets orbiting stars by measuring the reflex motion of the star due to the mutual tug of gravity. This is a, a plot that shows different stellar types. Uh, as stars become more massive, they become hotter and more luminous. Uh, versus the period, orbital period of a planet. And on this plot, you can define the habitable zone, which is the distance from the star where a planet would be at a temperature where you could have liquid water, which we think is necessary for any form of life that we would recognize. And uh, these different contours are different um, radial velocity precisions that you need uh, to detect planets. Currently, radio velocity precision is basically this contour and to the lower left. The G cleft precision will be up here. So it'll, it'll be in the vicinity of being able to detect Earth sized planets or nearly Earth sized planets orbiting around Sun like stars. And all of this region will be accessible uh, to the G cleft instrument. Another uh, planet plotted here. These are all of the rocky planets around the habitable zone that are known, or at least were known in 2017. Uh, Proxima Centauri b is a known rocky planet orbiting a star in the southern hemisphere, and we expect to be able to image that planet, uh, separate the light from the star, and characterize its atmosphere. Two of our spectrographs can be fiber coupled over a wide field of view. This is being prototyped in Australia. Uh, with uh, fibers that are self-mobile with piezoelectric devices. They can move around on a glass corrector plate. Change position. And I now want to talk briefly about some of the engineering challenges with the environment uh, that we have to deal with in Chile. And one of them is the seismic hazard. Chile is a very seismically active area. Uh, the largest earthquake actually ever recorded uh, occurred just off the coast of Chile. That was the 1960 magnitude 9.5. Uh, our site in Chile located on the map here with the star experiences about six earthquakes a month. Uh, and in the last five years, this is the spectrum of earthquake magnitude that we've experienced. So earthquakes are, are a challenging environment for a telescope this size. So we've determined we need to do something to mitigate uh, the hazard from earthquakes. And so we've, we're borrowing something from the civil engineering realm. Uh, this is a cross section showing our telescope uh, and it's supported typically, telescopes are supported on a very thick concrete pier, which is in contact with uh, bedrock. Uh, the, the stiffer and firmer the interface, the better. We're gonna split that ring wall of the concrete pier and place 24 friction pendulums around the wall so that when the ground moves laterally above a certain threshold, that it will allow the, the ground to slide around under the telescope and not transmit that accelerating force. So these are commonly used to protect things like the space shuttle in the California Science Center. You can see these friction pendulums if you visit there. Uh, and underneath the Pasadena City Hall, it was built in the early part of the 20th century, the, the entire uh, complex uh, supported on 240 of these friction pendulums. So this is a novel application and uh, we've had to pay close attention to how to make this work uh, without compromising the performance of the telescope. Another challenge we have is that we have to build the enclosure in such a way that the airflow uh, over the enclosure does not add additional atmospheric distortion. So we did quite a campaign of computational fluid dynamics analysis to look at different configurations uh, for the enclosure. And we still are using this to understand what kind of wind disturbances occur, how much they affect the image quality. 
and that's guiding our design of the enclosure and the telescope. This is a look at what the enclosure configuration uh, looks like in, in uh, closed up and, and uh, closed to weather. During a typical night observing run where it's open and uh, shutter doors are open to allow air to flow uh, smoothly through. And we have the ability to block the wind if the wind is so strong it's causing excessive vibration or wind shake on the telescope. Currently the enclosure has completed its preliminary design and is now in final design. And this is what the observatory site looks like today. Uh, we leveled uh, the mountain uh, to have enough room to place two uh, 30 meter class telescopes. Uh, so we're building right now in, on this side of the mesa and you can see the hard rock excavations for the uh, enclosure foundations. Here's one for the telescope concrete ring wall for the pier, uh, a trench for utilities. This is where all the rotating machinery will be located. And then we have enough room on the other side of the mesa to put a second such telescope in the future or an even larger telescope uh, if, uh, if necessary. Now I'm gonna say something briefly about the science. Uh, we have a beautiful science book, which you can get from our, uh, our uh, website, www.gmto.org uh, slash resources. Uh, it was written in 2018 and it's, it's written basically for uh, so someone at any level of knowledge about astronomy can access this document and uh, extract uh, useful and meaningful information. So if you're a professional card carrying astronomer, if you're just a novice, um, you can find this a, a good read. And these are the various chapters ranging from exoplanets and star formation through the life cycle of stars, the building of galaxies, the evolution of galaxies, cosmology in the dark universe, referring to dark matter and dark energy and the very early uh, period after the big bang. And some of the uh, interesting science objectives for the observatory uh, will involve exoplanets. Uh, we intend to locate uh, and study uh, planet formation, uh, search for extrasolar life in the atmosphere of some of these planets. Uh, we are trying to understand better the supermassive black holes and how they evolved over time. They seem to have formed uh, early on in the universe. We're also interested in looking at for intermediate mass black holes. You know, we know about smaller black holes when, when uh, stars supernova and collapse or you have an in spiral of stars that form a black hole. And we know about supermassive black holes at the center of many galaxies, but we don't know about intermediate black, uh, mass black holes, whether they exist. Uh, and so we wanna study the motion of stars and galaxy uh, or star clusters and, and look for evidence of intermediate uh, black holes. Uh, galaxy evolution, as I showed you in the earlier graphic, we're trying to understand how galaxies put themselves together, how star, star formation occurred uh, over the life of the, of the universe. Uh, and then cosmology and fundamental physics, trying to understand more about what this mysterious dark matter might be, uh, dark energy, the, the tension that exists now in the Hubble constant, uh, which uh, may be an indicator that there's new physics to be discovered. Uh, and then of course, the most exciting area uh, are the discoveries that will be made by the Giant Magellan Telescope that we can't anticipate today. Every time we put a new telescope, open a new window on the universe, we discover things we didn't even know how to ask uh, questions of. Uh, and so I'm sure that some of those are in store with these extremely large telescopes. Uh, so with that, I think I'll end my talk and uh, turn it back over uh, to, uh, to Larry. Let me unshare my screen. Well, thank you very much, Jim, for a fascinating glimpse at all of the ingenuity and engineering that's gone into creating this telescope. And we're looking forward to, uh, in the years coming, uh, hearing about the results of observations made with the telescope. Uh, we have Time for a Q&A session. Well, let's start with uh, PSW member James 
Van Artstelem. He has two questions. Jim, if you could unmute your mic and ask your questions. Yes, hi. I was wondering if you could talk about the mathematical modeling that was involved to, to calculate the proper curvature of the mirrors and to guide their polishing. So that's a, that's a good question. So the polishing of these mirrors um, is a very sophisticated process. First of all, the optical design of the telescope follows a particular formula. So we know what shape we want the optical surfaces to be. Uh, these glass mirrors, although they're very stiff at the uh, dimensions of the wavelength of light, they are still flexible. So the mirror is first supported on a polishing cell where the forces um, at each of the attach points are, uh, are very precisely uh, controlled. Uh, so that gives a, a known boundary condition to the glass. Uh, and then uh, there are four different methods that we use uh, to determine what the shape of the mirror is. The shape is so irregular to begin with that you cannot form an interference uh, pattern by reflecting light off the surface. Uh, and so there are, uh, there are different methods. One method um, is to, uh, uh, in a very controlled way, raster scan like a, a hockey puck on an air, uh, like, a, like, an, like on a, uh, an air hockey board. There, it floats on a thin layer of air and you can measure the contour of the mirror. And that's used in the early stages. Uh, then there's another method that uh, uses light to reflect off the surface and model the contour. And then finally, when you get close enough to the correct shape, uh, you can form an interference pattern and use that to guide the final polishing. So the polishing takes many months. Um, it's an extractive process, not an additive process. You need to be careful not to remove too much material. Uh, so you converge on the proper shape of uh, very uh, gradually and carefully. Uh, we have a question from uh, Wendy Friedman. Wendy? Hi, Jim, really enjoyed your talk. I just wanted to ask you a lot of the risks, initial risks of the technology for the GMT have now been retired as you have so eloquently described. And I wondered from your perspective, what you see as the remaining technical challenges to the, the GMT, the, the, the most significant challenges that remain. Um, some of the most, uh, hi Wendy, it's nice to hear from you. Um, some of the most significant challenges remaining um, are the uh, construction of off axis adaptive secondary mirrors. Um, we're in the early stages of manufacturing the first uh, of those assemblies. I should say that the National Science Foundation was generous enough to provide us with about $17 million uh, for a technology work on adaptive optics and, and phasing of the telescope. And some of that is uh, going towards manufacturing the first off-axis adaptive secondary mirror. Um, those um, flexible mirrors are a meter in diameter, but they're only two millimeters thick. So they're extremely thin and fragile. Uh, and this is what allows us to bend them in the complex shapes to do the adaptive optics correction uh, without uh, risk of uh, fatiguing or damaging them. Uh, but no one's ever built one of these things with an off axis shape. So that's a technical challenge. And then the area of phasing the telescope uh, and verifying that we actually can achieve this in the face of realistic atmospheric disturbances and other effects uh, has caused us to build uh, two additional test beds. These are also funded with uh, uh, funding from the National Science Foundation. Uh, so we're building those test beds and that will give us uh, risk reduction at a higher level of assembly of putting the various components and uh, control systems together uh, to verify that in fact we can we can achieve the phasing. So those are two um, two of the major challenges. We also have under contract uh, the uh, development and fabrication of the telescope structure. It's a very large structure uh, and it has to uh, track very smoothly uh, and provide the kind of stiffness that we need to position and, and uh, uh, support the optical elements. Um, there's not so much technology associated with it, but it is a very large assembly. So we're eager to get on and, 
and retire that risk as well. Uh, we have a question from uh, Bob Terry. Bob, PSW member. Okay, hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Oh, good, yes. good, good. Uh, I was curious, the, the structure appears to be somewhat open and you have wind screens and how do you mitigate the problem of dust and grit blowing through the housing and getting on surfaces? Do you, how do you protect that very valuable optic? Well, that's a good question. Um, how do we keep dust out of the enclosure because it's open and, and the winds can be pretty pretty fierce. Uh, well, the first thing we'll do is, is we'll, we'll put a particular kind of, uh, of gravel on the ground to try to prevent fine particles from being blown up right next to the observatory. Um, but some amount of dust and grit will get into the telescope uh, and uh, in particular on the surface uh, of the optics. Uh, and we want to keep the surface of the optics as dust free as possible. So probably on a daily basis during the day shift, uh, since we only do observing at night, uh, we will uh, we will go through a cleaning process. Uh, it's customary to use what's called CO2 snow, uh, which you can blow on the optic and dislodge dust. Uh, and we also have a plan to do wet washing of the mirrors uh, to keep them as clean as possible and for the reflective coating to be as durable as possible. Uh, so uh, we will take uh, some cleanliness measures on the telescope. The hydrostatic bearing film that the azimuth and elevation bearings run on are, are protected uh, you know, by uh, labyrinth seals and other means to try to keep dust and the oil is recirculated and filtered to keep it out of the bearing surface. So there are some things that, that we can do. But not a trivial matter at all. Uh, not a trivial matter, but um, uh, one advantage of a telescope this large is that the telescope is, is fairly high off the ground uh, compared to a smaller telescope. And uh, so we have some experience with this. Thank you. Let's just take a second to say hello to some of our uh, viewers from afar. Uh, we have uh, uh, hello to you on the west coast of Sweden and hello to you in Medellin, Colombia and in Montreal, Quebec and in Australia. I'm glad that you're joining us. And I hope you're finding this as interesting as I am. We have a question from Carl Merrill, a molecular biologist. Uh, Carl. Thank you. Uh, you, you. You mentioned um, using the telescope to look at black holes. And I, recently we've had an image of a black hole by a collection of telescopes that were all matched with precision timing. And then they analyzed all the data at a central location. So the question is, how will this telescope, what information will this be able to give us that you can't do that way? Or how will they work together? Or what's your vision for that? So the, um, the Event Horizon uh, telescope image, a stunning achievement with uh, radio telescopes across the globe. So those, those images were constructed from radio wavelengths uh, and uh, in the, in the radio part of the spectrum, you have the ability uh, to, uh, to demodulate the signal uh, and record it with precise timing uh, data that you can then use to synthesize uh, essentially composite images. Uh, we do not have the ability to do that in the optical part of the spectrum. So our approach to exploring black holes will be more conventional uh, we will be observing with the maximum resolution of the telescope, uh, uh, the environ uh, environment around black holes and studying the emission of material uh, that is in the accretion disk or is in falling across the event horizon and understand better uh, the, uh, the physics of, of those high, very high gravity environments. Thank you. So, so basically, you, you're saying you, you, you could not combine a, a set of, of telescopes, even if they were close by, and uh, using optics for if, that. So if, if, the, if the telescopes are in physical proximity, uh, then you can 
combine the light uh, into an optical interferometer. That was done uh, at the Keck Observatory. So the two 10 meter telescopes were linked together optically to form a 100 meter baseline interferometer. And that gives you the ability uh, to, uh, to image uh, using the uh, diffraction limit of a, of a telescope whose aperture is equal to the separation between the telescopes. Uh, but there's a limit uh, to the distance over which you can do that. So there, there are no uh, telescopes in close enough proximity to the giant Magellan telescopes where we could do that. Now, in principle, if we built a, a second giant telescope on the other side of the Mesa, uh, we could link the two together as an optical interferometer and, and do what you're describing. Thank you. Okay, we have a, a question from uh, a YouTube viewer. Forgive me if I get this wrong. Um, Brian Camelli, he says, very exciting, very large project. Doesn't it require a large maintenance? And what is the life expectancy of the GMT? Uh, all very good questions. Let me uh, answer them in, in reverse order. So the, uh, the lifetime uh, we've uh, defined for the observatory is 50 years. Uh, and so we're doing the seismic design, for example, so that there's a very low likelihood of catastrophic damage, even in the face of a, uh, a survival level earthquake that might occur near our site. Um, so 50 years is the, is the operational lifetime, but of course, um, there's nothing to prevent the telescope in principle from having a much longer life. Um, there is quite a bit of engineering and maintenance that's required on something this large and complex. Uh, so there will be a sizable engineering team that during the day shift uh, will perform various maintenance functions. Uh, the interval for maintenance will vary depending on uh, what the subsystem or component uh, uh, may be. Uh, but um, yes, it's, uh, you know, the, the telescope is so large uh, that you can be on part of the telescope and not be able to see somebody on, on another part of the telescope. So uh, just coordinating uh, between people working on the telescope will probably require some kind of a radio communication system. And of course, the safety aspects of working on something like this are also um, a bit more challenging. Uh, there are confined spaces, there are fall hazards, there, you know, there are many hazards that we have to engineer for. We have a question from Brett Magaram, who's the PSW treasurer. He's a structural engineer. And he asks, if you're constantly deforming the mirrors many times per second, does fatigue become an issue with the mirrors or the aluminum coating? What is the expected lifespan of the mirrors and their coating? So um, another excellent question. So you're referring to the adaptive secondary mirrors, those mirrors that we deform at uh, two kilohertz uh, bandwidth. Uh, so as I mentioned, these mirrors are very thin. They're two millimeters th thin. So they're, they're actually very thin face sheets of, of glass or zero door uh, material. And the amount that we are deforming them is very slight. Again, we're, we're deforming them uh, on the scale of the wavelength of light. So while we're moving them very rapidly and you know, high cycle uh, uh, exposure, uh, the amount of stress that's developed uh, is, is quite limited, it's, it's quite low. Um, as for the reflective coating, uh, the reflective coating is, is, is probably gonna be about a thousand times thinner than the diameter of a human hair. Uh, and so again, it, it's not going to develop very much stress. Uh, we have a question from uh, PSW member Connor Nixon. He's a member of the general committee. He's a uh, space scientist at NASA Goddard. And Connor? Oh, yeah. Well, first of all, I want to congratulate James on the technological achievement and uh, really fantastic talk. And I wish the <clears throat> GMT project the best of luck. Um, my question is, <clears throat> what is the long wavelength cutoff of the telescope? Um, I work a lot with the NASA IRTF, so I was, I was interested about uh, what are the longest wavelengths you uh, eventually envisage being able to reach with instrumentation? And is it more limited by the atmosphere or by the telescope itself? 
Well, uh, our current generation of instruments uh, will operate out to about five microns. Um, I think the, the long wavelength limit is really gonna come about from the fact that, uh, that there will be thermal emission. Uh, the telescope is at ambient temperature. So at some point, you know, when you're approaching uh, uh, 10 microns or beyond, um, you know, you're, you're gonna be better off going to space to, to, do, the, uh, to do the measurements or to have a, a cool telescope in some manner. Uh, so in principle, the telescope will support longer wavelengths and indeed we may uh, field instruments at, uh, at longer wavelengths, uh, but it's, uh, it's the thermal IR that, that will set the, uh, the background limit. Thank you. There's All still right. reasons to go to space. We have another question from uh, a YouTube viewer. Um, um, again, apologies if I pronounce your name wrong. It's uh, Yang Chu. Uh, he asks, uh, what fraction of light energy or information is lost after each reflection? Ah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so when surfaces uh, are coated and the coating is clean and fresh, um, the loss is, uh, is, is a function of wavelength and that's partly what you <clears throat> take into consideration when you choose a coating. Uh, <clears throat> but um, uh, I would say a good coating will lose um, less than a percent typically uh, in most, uh, most wavelengths, um, you know, up to um, a couple, 3%. Um, the challenge is that if you have many reflections, you know, you, you, they're, they're multiplicative. So you, you lose a percent and then you lose another percent on top of it. And it's not additive, it's multiplicative. Uh, and so uh, you wanna keep the number of reflections to, to a minimum. Okay, we have a question from uh, Noah Block. Uh, hi, Noah. You can I ask your question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, I was just like to ask, um, who's going to be analyzing all the data that's generated by the telescope? Will anyone be able to log on and just get the data analyzed it themselves, or does it go to a few specific institutions? So that's a that's a very interesting question. So what's what I find interesting is that the history of the world's largest telescopes uh, is really a history of, uh, of telescopes being in the hands of private institutions or individuals. Um, it has not traditionally been the role of government, at least not in the United States, uh, to be involved in developing the world's largest telescopes. And for that reason, uh, the institutions that have paid for the telescopes and operate them have more or less exclusive access to the data. Uh, and this is what it, uh, allows institutions to attract the best and brightest minds to their faculty, uh, is to give the faculty access to uniquely powerful instrumentation. Now, <clears throat> the data um, for the private consortium uh, would be made available uh, to the consortium. Uh, but I have to mention that we are in dialogue uh, with the National Science Foundation about the US government becoming a participant uh, with the Giant Magellan Telescope, they would become a, a partner and their interest would be in uh, getting a, a portion of the observing time of the telescope, uh, possibly a sizable portion of the observing time and making that available to the entire US astronomy community. So in some sense, a fraction of the telescope time would be a national asset. Uh, and then anyone could apply for time and go through the time allocation committee process uh, and, and make use of the telescope and have access to the data. So uh, the NSF has not made a decision whether it wants to proceed uh, down that path. Um, there's an important uh, decadal survey that the US government is undertaking at the moment uh, the National Academies of Science and Engineering undertake decadal surveys every 10 years in various parts of the scientific uh, domain uh, and determine what the nation's priorities should be in science for the next decade. 
and NASA, the National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, uh, these agencies that do science pay uh, attention to those reports and those priorities uh, when they set their programs and their funding and their budgets. So the decadal survey is expected to be released for ground-based uh, or for astronomy, I should say, and space science is expected to be released sometime between the 1st of April and uh, the end of June. Uh, and so uh, we briefed the decadal survey on a concept called the US Extremely Large Telescope, uh, where both the Giant Magellan Telescope and the 30 meter telescope, uh, which is uh, planned to be built in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, would uh, join forces, uh, if you will, with the National Science Foundation to give the US community access to both of those telescopes in both hemispheres uh, for, for general research purposes. Thank you very much. Is, isn't it the case though that uh, even if it remains in private hands after a certain period of time, the data will be available for more general use in the community? I think the trend is to make data available after a period of time in the community. Um, the, the data um, handling uh, arrangements or the data sharing arrangements um, are still being negotiated within the consortium. And so I, I can't give you a definitive answer on how or when uh, the, uh, the, the private consortium's data would be made available more broadly. Uh, you know, perhaps Wendy actually who used to chair the board of the uh, Giant Magellan Telescope uh, would have uh, a comment on that. Would the broad community get access to the to the private consortium's uh, data from the GMT? Yeah, ultimately the goal is to make all of the data accessible within uh, likely a 12 month period. So that is what facilities in space now do. So for example, Hubble Space Telescope as a principal investigator, you would apply for time and you would have access to those data for some proprietary period. And the idea with the GMT also is to have proprietary time for the initial investigator to do the science that they propose to do, but then make it accessible to the general community uh, through an archive. So, so that has been the idea of the GMT since its inception, yes. And, and the experience with the Hubble Space Telescope has been that about 50% of the science now, the papers that are being published are coming through data in the archive and making the data more generally accessible has clearly been better for the scientific community. Uh, people come up with novel ideas in the future and, uh, and science is better overall if you make it generally accessible. Yeah, that, that is definitely the trend and uh, I see that continuing. Yeah, I, from what little I know, there seems to be a pretty strong consensus that that's, that's the way we should go. Not we, but you know. That's the way it should be done. Um, <clears throat> that a sort of uh, related question as to what what extent and is artificial intelligence and those kinds of programs um, going to be a very important factor in how the data from these GMT and the other very large telescopes is is analyzed, interpreted, and the result results are produced. So the, I'm not an expert in this area, but my, uh, my uh, instinct is that artificial intelligence will become increasingly important to the kind of big data analysis that uh, Wendy was describing before. Uh, you know, there are increasingly massive archives of data of, of different wavelengths from different instruments. And you know, if you wanna get an understanding of how the physics of the universe works, you need to be looking across the spectrum in, in various kinds of, of, of ways uh, and aspects of the data. And I can imagine that uh, uh, artificial intelligence will be adapted uh, to finding patterns and finding uh, correlations and, and you know, other relationships in the data. Uh, and so uh, I would imagine that, that that will play an increasing role. I have a question from uh, YouTube again from uh, BSW member Will Angel. I don't think he's related to the telescope maker, but maybe. Uh, Will, I'm sorry, Will, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, I have to read this. <laughs> a little confused. Will future telescopes continue becoming large individual telescopes or will telescope arrays 
and interferometry play a larger role in breakthrough telescopes in the future? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I would say that I, I would have expected interferometry to play a larger role than it has uh, in recent years. Um, you know, it, it, it's difficult to build large monolithic telescopes. There are various ideas out there for uh, sparse aperture telescopes where you would, um, you would space the mirrors out maybe on a common mount. You know, there's something similar to this right now today in the large binocular telescope that was built by the University of Arizona. But you can imagine, uh, for example, a ring of, of these 8.4 meter mirrors on a large uh, uh, diameter, which you could, you could um, uh, synthesize as a sparse aperture array or an interferometer. So I think you're likely to see uh, growth in both directions, uh, larger monolithic telescopes, as well as more innovative uh, and, uh, and creative designs. But uh, time will tell. I have a related question. So all of these monolithic mirrors being made at, at Arizona are 8.4 meters. Is there something magical about 8.4 meters or that was just the practical limit at the time? Well, you probably could make a larger mirror, but you'd, you'd need to get a, a different uh, facility. And you have to think about how you're gonna move the mirror from the mirror lab to, to your observatory location. Uh, and these are already so large when, when they're in their transport containers, they're about 10 meters across. Uh, it gets difficult even to, to go down a, a, a freeway uh, with something that's much larger than that. So I think there just becomes a practical, a practical limit of, of moving the, the hardware around. Um, but um, I think 8.4 meters is, is, uh, is a comfortable size from the point of view of uh, the, the process is pretty well uh, established by now. They have a very high success rate. Uh, my fingers are crossed that our, our mirror number six will come out successfully when it's cast tomorrow. Uh, but um, you know, I suppose someone could uh, could build a mirror factory on their observatory site and not worry about uh, having to move it down the freeway. Practical considerations not having to do actually with the technology for casting the mirror. I think it's I think it's just practical considerations. We have a question from a relatively new PSW member, Faras Assam. Again, apologies if I have not pronounced your name properly. Faras, you have to unmute your mic. Well, uh, Technical issue, I, I can read the question. He wants to know how much it costs and when it will be ready. Uh, two very practical questions. Uh, so the Giant Magellan Telescope total project cost is estimated to be about $2 billion. Uh, and uh, we expect to have first light of the telescope by the end of this decade. Uh, that first light will probably occur when we have four of the seven segments on the telescope. Um, we are going to be commissioning the telescope uh, as we add optics uh, near segments to it. Uh, we probably won't build out the full observatory until the early part of the next decade. Uh, we have a question from uh, a YouTube viewer, a friend of ours down in Colombia, South America, and he has a a very timely question. He wants to know what, in essence, he wants to know whether or not this telescope's ability to observe will be affected by the large constellations of satellites that are, are being put up by SpaceX and others. And uh, if so what, what's the plan to deal with that? Yes, that is a timely, timely question. Um, Yes, so there are plans to put uh, many thousands of satellites into Earth orbit. Um, this is probably um, a, a bigger issue for telescopes that are designed to do uh, surveying of the sky 
uh, where they have a very large field of view and they are covering the sky uh, rapidly uh, in a synoptic uh, sense. So the, uh, the, the Vera Rubin telescope, for example, does exactly that and they will not be able to avoid uh, satellite trails coming through their, uh, their imaging. Uh, and so they are developing uh, data analysis techniques to identify uh, where the satellite trails have uh, affected the data and ways to remove those signatures from the data. For telescopes like the Giant Magellan Telescope, where we have a smaller field of view than a survey machine, uh, we will probably have the ability to schedule our observations, you know, knowing the trajectories of the, you know, the ephemerides of the satellite orbits. We will probably be able to avoid them uh, uh, to some extent. Uh, and because we are observing uh, over a small field of view will be less susceptible to contamination. I know that the American Astronomical Society and the uh, International Astronomical Union are, uh, have committees that are studying this issue. Um, SpaceX has been very receptive to the issue. They, they have, you know, they're, they're very um, supportive of astronomy and science. They don't want to negatively impact the field. Uh, and so they're actively working to uh, design the satellites to be uh, minimally reflective and to uh, minimize their signature on the sky. Possibly more of a more threatened are the radio telescope uh, observatories on the ground because the emissions from the radio emissions from the satellites um, uh, will possibly become an issue for them. So this is something that that you know we're we're trying to better understand and develop uh, methodologies to work around it, and the satellite manufacturers are on their end trying to find ways to min minimize the impact the satellites will have. But it, but it is an issue. I have a question from Glenda Turner. I think Glenda can ask this question directly. Oh, Glenda. Yes, thank you. Uh, excellent presentation. I, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to um, uh, uh, how the science operations uh, would be uh, are would be managed and and located. Like, do you have op center op operation centers? How many different locations does your total project encompass? So that's a good question and, and a question that that has not finally been resolved. Uh, there is likely to be a, uh, an operations uh, facility, uh, probably in La Serena, which is relatively uh, accessible to the observatory. Uh, there is likely to be uh, a set of remote observing facilities uh, that you could go to to operate the telescope. We envision um, a mixture of what's called classical observing, uh, where people travel to the telescope to make their observations and remote observing. Um, part of the observing strategy is to uh, cue, what's called cue schedule the observations to match the observations against the exact observing conditions that you have. Uh, some observations can be made uh, only when the weather is pristine, other observations can be made uh, when, when you know, the moon is out, for example, um, which is a bright, um, bright stray light source. Um, uh, so um, the operations plan is still in development uh, and um, uh, is, uh, is, is something that will be documented and, and we'll have discussions with the National Science Foundation as well. Uh, we are working with the NSF's uh, Noir Lab, their, their optical and IR research laboratory uh, in Tucson, Arizona. They have a lot of experience um, operating observatories for the National Science Foundation and doing Q scheduling. Uh, and so we're working with them on the, the various roles that they would have uh, in the uh, data analysis and possibly also tools that we could make use of for scheduling uh, real-time operations of the telescope. 
Thanks. I have a bit of a follow-up question to that. So um, a lot of these instruments are, you know, there's no need for uh, an astronomer to be looking through an eyepiece to observe anything. Um, and setting up the instruments is a, a sort of a technical exercise in a way. And the data gathering, you know, is all digital and it gets pumped down to, you know, to a screen, to a computational resource to be stored. What's, what's the need for, and, you know, somebody who's doing the astronomy to be on site as opposed to down at the ocean in you know, a more comfortable environment? Right. So you're, you're, you're quite right that uh, with all of the automation and technology, uh, you can do observing remotely. In fact, there are telescopes where, uh, that operate where there's no one at the telescope. They're completely robotic. Um, you can get on your, your laptop from your sailboat and do observing uh, remotely. Um, what other observatories have found, the Gemini Observatory, for example, uh, is that when, you're, when your user community um, never visits the observatory, um, they, they, lose, um, they lose a contact, uh, uh, almost a social contact with the observatory. And so uh, you know, the sense of ownership, connection, understanding of how the observatory operates are enhanced by having uh, a fraction of the observing done in this classical mode. So I think the bulk of observing will be exactly as you described, it'll be remote. Um, there'll be an engineering team that services the telescope during the day and, uh, and people to assist the observing at the telescope at night. Uh, but the bulk of the observers will probably not be traveling. Uh, but I think it's important to keep that human contact with the observatory, at least at, at some level. Thanks. There are two, two last questions. We'll, we'll end with Bob Abramson's question. But before that, uh, a question. Um, is this scalable? Could you add another ring of 8.4 8, uh, meter mirrors in a subsequent design? And would it be worthwhile to do that? Yeah, so uh, I think absolutely it is scalable. In fact, I think I've seen a drawing of the telescope that has another ring of these 8.4 meter mirrors. Um, the, the tendency is once you've mastered a particular approach uh, to scale it. So for example, uh, the 30 meter telescope uh, is scaling up the approach that was taken for, for the Keck 10 meter with hexagonal segments. Uh, you know, Keck has you know, uh, 36 segments. The 30 meter telescope has 492 segments. And the Europeans are taking a similar approach and they have, I don't know, a semi-infinite number of uh, <laughs> segments. Um, so what they've done is they, they took a system that worked with Keck and they've scaled it. And I think the same thing is likely uh, uh, to occur with the, with the giant Magellan telescope. Thanks, last question from Bob Abramson. Bob? When we um, begin to make new discoveries with the James Webb Space Telescope in coming years, can you um, maybe identify a couple of examples where uh, those discoveries will pave the way for uh, certain investigations that uh, the GMT will be well suited to pick up on and uh, and and you know leverage and or synergize with. Sorry, there there has been and will continue to be a synergy between ground-based astronomy and space-based. Um, there are points uh, in both types of telescope. You know, for example, uh, James Webb is going to operate out at longer wavelengths. Uh, uh, and uh, will have the advantage of the kind of stability that you get being in space. Uh, so uh, it will no doubt be able to, to make observations that we cannot make, you know, we have wavelengths we cannot reach from the ground. Uh, and I think that uh, there will be objects of interest that will be discovered by James Webb where you know, we, we want to get a spectrum uh, that requires more light and we can bring a ground-based telescope to bear. Um, there was a tremendous amount of synergy between the Kepler mission, which was doing the exoplanet search and ground-based telescopes. Ground-based machines were, 
were key to the follow-up from Kepler to determine uh, whether the Kepler detections were real planets or, or whether they were false alarms. Uh, so there will be a synergy, not just with James Webb, but with the uh, 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 all of the space assets. Uh, again, there's, there's a complementarity of, of, uh, of strengths and capabilities. So um, I think we're stronger uh, because of that, syn that synergy between the two. Well, I wish we could go on, but <clears throat> thank you so much for, for giving this informative lecture. We really appreciate the time that you spent both in giving the lecture, answering the questions and the time that we spent together beforehand. So thank you very much. As you know, you have a rain check on the reception and dinner, social hour and after party that we, we can't really have because we're not permitted to meet in person, but when you're in DC and the stars align, so to speak, you are welcome and we hope you will join us for a different PSW event. Thank you, I look forward to that when we can travel once again, uh, I can meet you in person and meet some of your members. Um, I very much appreciate the invitation. I've enjoyed the conversation. Terrific lecture, thanks so much. And thank everyone for joining us. Uh, the recording of tonight's lecture will be available to everyone on the PSW Science YouTube channel and in due course on Vimeo and via the PSW Science website. Please share the links with your friends and subscribe to the channels for notifications on new postings. And do not hesitate to join. It's easy to apply for membership using the join button on the PSW Science website. And before you go, a few important closing announcements. The next lecture, I should say before I get to the next lecture, I want to note once again that PSW will mark the 150th anniversary of its founding on March 13th of this year, one week and a day from today. We will not unfortunately be able to celebrate the occasion in person on that day, but we will be doing so when it is again safe and permitted for us to get together. PSW's sesquicentennial will not go uncelebrated. And indeed, we will be commemorating the society's first 150 years and looking forward to its next 150 years throughout the year. Watch for special announcements. The next lecture will be in two weeks. On March 19th, 2021, the speaker will be Kate Kraft of Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. She will be speaking on the Europa Clipper mission this will be our second lecture on missions to Europa, the first being Christopher Waldman's talk on the German Triple Project. That video is available on the PSW Science YouTube channel and Vivio channel and via the PSW website. The 2000 438th meeting will be on April 9th. The speaker will be Todd Lipson of Columbia University. He will be speaking on the five ways of AI, past, present, future. This is the first of what we hope will be a series of lectures exploring how advances in AI will affect and perhaps fundamentally change science. The 2439th meeting will be on April 23rd. The speakers will be Simon Bennett and Dan Irwin of the London Crosswell Project. They will be speaking on the construction of the new Elizabeth Line subway, cutting underneath London, sometimes within an arm's length of its loftiest skyscrapers, successfully completed with the use of a digital representation of London underground and above ground. The 2441st meeting will be on May 21st and the speaker will be Bill Powell of the State University of New York College of environmental sciences and forestry. And he'll be speaking about the chestnut blight and about genetic and molecular biological approaches to creating a blight resistant American chestnut tree. Additional lectures of the spring lecture series will be posted to the PSW website. Please check there often for updates. And before we go, let's not forget to thank the crew James, Cameo, and Robin for producing tonight's event. Thank you. 
And I will now adjourn the 2436th meeting of the society. I wish everybody a wonderful evening or rest of the day, wherever you happen to be. The meeting is adjourned.